basically now you've got everything in place, so we're ready to go. I mean, I'm sure you've done this, what, a hundred times? Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, this. Oh, sorry, Brian. Listen, I didn't get much sleep last night. You want to patch me the ratchet, please? Not quite right, but I'll torque it later. Hold it. This isn't the way real life works. If we all went around with background music warning us to watch out, maybe we'd never make any errors. Take a look at the way things really are. Real life doesn't come with a music track or cue cards. Corporal Joe Murphy over there is one of the best. Ready to go. I'm sure you've done this a hundred times, right? I He's mean, worked on this bleed air assembly dozens of times, trained many of the others on it. In fact, familiarity is one reason. I didn't get much sleep last night. You want to patch me the ratchet, please? Why something's about to sneak through a well-established safety net of procedures and checks. Well, it's not quite right, but I'll torque it later. But it gets more complicated than that. Why would Joe make an error? What underlying factors could have led up to this moment, which could have such deadly consequences? Today. An update on the incident, we go live to News Radio's Peter Lewis, who's out at the base. Thanks, Andy. The Canadian Forces Hercules was setting out on a regular test flight earlier this Sunday afternoon. It seems that the pilot aborted the takeoff at the last minute when fire broke out in one of its engines. We've been told that Accident statistics tell us that about 80% of major aviation accidents involve human errors, not equipment failure. And 12% of those human errors involve maintenance. What we're talking about today is something called human factors, which is a polite way of explaining why somebody tripped up. In a context like ours, it also implies someone else didn't catch the mistake. Simply put, Human factors are those elements which affect our behavior and performance, especially those that may cause us to make errors. Human factors include everyday work problems such as lack of knowledge or distraction, fatigue or routine. Human factors can be a lack of resources or stress, incomplete or inaccurate communication, and pressure to deliver. On a personal basis, Human factors may involve issues like financial problems, a divorce, or sick kids and aged parents. But no matter what the problem is, or where it stems from, in our world, it can lead to a mistorqued bolt, a forgotten fastener, a unit mounted backwards, or an inspection left undone. There are certainly good backup systems and double checks in place to ensure that when a human factor or something else causes an error that it is caught before it causes an accident. The greatest danger arises when two or more human factors combine in a danger zone to trigger a chain of events that causes an accident. So how do we break the chain? Well, first by understanding more about the influence of human factors on our behavior, then doing something to avoid their negative effects. In the next few minutes, we'll look at a story in which human factors play a significant part. Some factors will be obvious, others less so. See how many you can identify. Preliminary information from investigators of Sunday's aborted takeoff of a Canadian Forces C-130 Hercules suggests that a maintenance procedure may have contributed to the accident. D&D spokesmen say a flight safety board of inquiry is getting underway to determine the cause of the fire. Thursday, uh, we'd all put in about six hours worth of overtime, uh, partly due to problems on the Herc, and the test bed we needed still hadn't been repaired, so everybody was really stressed out. Then when I got home, I found out my seven-year-old Jimmy had had a pretty serious head injury during hockey that day. I mean, the hospital said they were running some tests and keeping him overnight. It, it just didn't sound good. Both me and Donna were at the hospital till after midnight. In fact, she stayed overnight. She was still there early Friday morning with Jimmy. 
She promised to call me at work as soon as the results came in. Corporal Murphy's crew was on duty Friday during the shift that preceded Sunday's accident. His was one of the signatures on the major entry. So once I got to work on Friday morning, my mind was, you know, in a couple of places at the same time. My kid's condition was number one, and the problems we were having with completing the aircraft on time was another. Joe and the rest of his maintenance ship were expecting a pre-inspection briefing for the next aircraft coming in, before getting back to the periodic inspection they were doing. Its end date was the following Wednesday, and there was still a lot of work to do. The crew wanted to get going, but the warrant officer had set up the briefing, and there were a few other things I wanted to talk over with him, quietly, before the weekend. Like Brian, for instance. He's new on the crew, just transferred in from an AMSE, and he's under the gun to get qualified on Herc systems fast. Brian's a bit older, eh? Only a couple of years till retirement, so he's feeling the pressure. Master Corporal Brian Matt has signed up for a trade-related community college course, but he's having trouble keeping up. He won't admit that he doesn't fully understand the material, and he's reluctant to ask Joe for too much more help. Corporal Menon David's another case. She gave her notice a few months ago that she won't be continuing after her six-year date, so she'll be gone by next summer. Menon was at one of those job hunting seminars Thursday night, and she was pretty tired Friday morning. I've been trying to help her, but she's pretty frustrated. She wants to stay in the area, but she's got five or six no thanks letters on her job applications. It's tough out there. May I have your attention, please? I was just speaking with the CEO, and he would like to extend his appreciation for the effort and dedication you've put forth. However, there's also bad news. We have an aircraft that just arrived this morning that has to be ready for a test flight at the latest Sunday. Oh. I sympathize with you, and I realize this is going to cause the cancellation of family day. So let's do the job and enjoy whatever weekend we have. Thank you very much. Go. So there went the weekend and the squadron family day we'd been planning for six weeks. And I still had no idea of how my kid was doing. You know, actually, if you could go and get me another one of these, that'd be great. Do you mind? OK, great. Thanks a lot. By 1,500 hours on Friday, Joe hadn't heard from his wife, and it was preying on his nerves. Oh, perfect. Perfect. That's great. Now listen, there's something I want to show you before we keep going. I was showing Brian a quick way of installing the clamps. I thought he understood what I was talking about. And you're basically ready to go. I'm sure you've done this a hundred times, right? Oh, sorry, Brian. Listen, I didn't get much sleep last night. You want to patch me the ratchet, please? Great, thanks. Well, it's not quite right, but I'll torque it later. Hey, listen, could you finish up for me? I'll be back to check it out in a couple of minutes. All right? Thanks a lot. There were at least seven human factors in the scene you've just watched. Did you catch them? Joe's personal stresses are pretty obvious. He's very worried about his son and tired from the late night at the hospital and the recent overtime shifts. And he's keeping most of it bottled up inside. Manon's tired too, and under stress from the need to reorient herself to a new kind of life outside the military. And some of that stress falls on the shoulders of her friends. Brian's new on the crew and embarrassed to admit that he isn't absolutely comfortable on what are, for him, new systems and procedures. Everybody's affected by the pressure. Sometimes deadlines are artificially imposed, and they often get amplified as they work their way down to the front line. But in this case, the pressure to get the aircraft ready is real, although there probably is not enough time. Another potentially dangerous factor involves norms, or shortcuts of replaced CFTO procedures. That's compounded when technicians are working on autopilot, finishing a job they've done many times. In fact, that's what Joe's been showing Brian this afternoon. 
This is when a distraction, even a slight break in concentration, can unwittingly start the chain of events in motion. Hey, listen, could you finish up for me? I'll be back to check it out in a couple of minutes, all right? And then there's this classic of poor communications, hearing what we want to hear, not what's been said, which has probably contributed to more accidents than any other human factor. The fact is, a whole series of human factors are at work here today, and at least three of them have combined to upset the normal system of checks and balances. Corporal Murphy. Good morning. My name is uh, Major Pierre Quérillon. I'm uh, president for this uh, Flight Safety Board of Inquiry. This is Major Rémi Poulain. I'm morning. director morning, of sir. Flight Safety. He's here as an investigator. Uh, Captain Ricker here. This is, uh, level of investigation has been called because the accident under investigation was a C category accident involving a serious injury. Uh, Corporal Murphy, I would like this to be uh, an honest and a wide open. Uh, fact-finding session. From initial damage reports, it looks as though a failure in the bleed air system might have initiated the accident. The board will interview a number of witnesses, focusing on identifying how the error was made and what caused it. And our role here is to come up with the appropriate recommendations which will prevent any recurrence of this accident. I will not uh, be asking you to be sworn in. I don't feel it's necessary. However, I would like for you to be... The DFS observer's main job is to quickly establish preventive measures. Because Joe's name is on the aircraft's pink sheet, he is one of the first to be called. Corporal Murphy, we have reason to believe uh, from what we heard from the flight crew and the damage report uh, that there was a failure in an installation that you were involved with on Friday. Uh, can you recall the procedures you took and what happened actually? Yes, sir. We started after the briefing at about 7.30 and uh, we removed the bleed air regulating valve from the number two engine. Uh, that took us a couple of hours and then we, uh, we began installation of the new valve. I'd say at about 1500 or maybe 1530, sir. You keep saying we and, and uh, us. Is that not a one-man job? How many people were involved? Well, sir, uh, I'd had some help earlier on from Corporal David, and then during installation of the new valve, uh, I was training Master Corporal Matt, sir. But you carried out the installation? Yes, sir. But Brian was helping me. And then just as I was about to finish the installation, uh, that's when I got the call. A call? You mean a phone call? Yes, sir. Um... Can we assume then that the whole installation stopped at that time? Uh, well, sir, I, I, uh, I asked Master Corporal Matt to carry on with it, sir. This is the man you were training? Yes, sir. I asked him to finish it off and said I'd be back to check it out in a minute or two, sir. So when you got back, you double-checked it? Yes, sir. I came back five minutes later, and I gave it a visual check and a hand check to make sure that it was in firmly. You say hand check. Isn't that supposed to be torqued at 85 inch-pounds? Yes, sir. 85 inch pounds, sir. And then uh, you did the visual inspection on the area before you closed the panels? That's correct, sir. And then you signed for it? Well, when, when Brian said that he checked it, I figured it was okay. So uh, I did a quick double check and went on to something else. <sighs> I'd, I'd never miss a thing like that. Corporal Murphy, I'd like to uh, shift our line of question now for a minute or two. Uh, what was the atmosphere like on Friday? What were the, the crew members feeling and how were they behaving? Well, it's important. We know Corporal Murphy. It's, uh, we understand it's difficult to talk about your friends, uh, but it's a question we need to ask everyone. Oh, I don't know, sir. I mean, we were, we were all pretty tired, I mean, with the overtime and all. Plus, we were being pressured to have the aircraft fully checked out by Sunday afternoon. I figured Brian knew the stuff. I mean, he'd been on the the Herc course and everything, and uh, he nodded his head about the procedures for installation, so uh, I believed him. I mean, I really didn't know the guy, but uh, from what I've heard, he was one of the best from his old crew. I wouldn't have signed if I hadn't thought that. I just can't believe it happened. And what about you, Corporal Murphy? What was on your mind? Well, uh, 
the three days before the accident, uh, the, that would have been on the Thursday, uh, we'd all put in about six hours worth of overtime, uh, partly due to problems on the Herc and the test bed we needed still hadn't been repaired, so everybody was really stressed out. And then I came home that night to find out that my seven-year-old Jimmy had suffered a head injury during hockey that day, and we were at the hospital. And in the first three segments of our story, we've moved from what happened to the Herc to the various human factors and the chain of events that caused it to happen. In the next scene, we'll be talking with some real and highly experienced technicians about how errors like Joe's could have been prevented and how the safety net can be kept intact. That accident wouldn't have happened if the chain of events that led to the bleed air failure had been broken. But could it have been? We showed the first part of this video to a group of experienced aircraft technicians and asked how they thought the error could have been averted. This is what they had to say. You can put two people in the very same job and the one will be totally stressed out and the other one will have none at all. I think it's how you handle it yourself. Some people need that stress. Yeah. It's a, it's a good motivator. I think a lot of people deny that they're suffering from stress and it actually probably compounds the problem instead of being able to tell somebody that you don't even do TGIFs anymore so you very seldom I, I know our crew never goes out for, for refreshments after Friday work you know I'd say beer but it's not good uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's it's a uh, so you don't have that vent that you used to have I know when I joined it was a, it was almost a ritual you know the last day of work you go to the golf course or the curling rink and everybody just vents question still how do you deal with the stress and uh, like Anko was saying uh, exercise is is excellent it's like I walk back and forth to work and it takes like 45 minutes each way and I'll tell you by the time I get home I could care less what happened all day some people go for smoking a coffee and other people uh, just go and try to find a, a little place to sit down and relax for a while away from everybody I think we could educate our, our members in, in the Canadian forces more on, on on ways of dealing with these types of situations, you know, to we could learn to relieve your stress. Yeah, we could. We could, um, you know, at least make them aware of of avenues to pursue if they feel on these types of pressures and things like that. I'm working on a midnight shift, um, biologically, um, at three o'clock in the morning, I cannot stay awake. Doesn't matter how much sleep I had during the day. Uh, at three o'clock, my body wants to shut down, and between three and five. I could barely function at my job. Cold, heat, the weather, I mean, <clears throat> you know, you go out and uh, say you're in servicing in the wintertime, after two hours of fueling jobs, you're more prone to be a little bit more complacent because you're waiting to get back in the hangar where it's nice and warm. So I think you got to be aware of that yourself and double check everything you've done. Being complacent and not really thinking about where you are in the prairies, I know, how, I don't know how many times you see people come in with frostbite and never even know it. You know, like, uh, it's up to somebody standing beside them and say, hey, you got to go in now. You're, you've been outside for an hour. You know, you're starting to turn white on us. <laughs> and uh, it's the same thing for fatigue. If you, you don't realize it yourself, you have to rely on somebody who works with you all the time to tell you, like, you need a break, sit down, take it easy for a little while. Or the, uh... Do you see the, the, the not using book? For instance, to do a job that you know they've never done before, uh, question them for sure, and then, you know, do you know where to find that in the book? Maybe even help them find it, whatever. Make sure that they're checking the book. Know what you can do, what your limits are, and uh, don't be afraid to say, hey, there's no way I'm doing this. You know, it's, it's unsafe for, for myself and the people who are working around me. You have to be able to go and ask for help. That's just, I mean, if, if, you, if you can't do that, then you're going to fail, and yeah. there's no two ways about it. Lay aside your pride. Because you know. everybody's going to be in the same situation. Everybody's going to have to put a, Everybody has to retrain. So at one point, everybody's going to have to just put away the pride and say, look, can you help me? And, and, uh, look at it like it's a game, like it's a, it's a challenge. You know, like, let's see if I can do it and still do it properly and, and get it done, you know. Set priorities, you know. Start with your highest priority and work your way down and 
if your job doesn't quite get completed on time, it's going to be the lowest priority thing anyway. Key on what your probably your best asset is in doing a job. Right. If you got a choice, if there's your crew's tasked with three jobs and an engine change, a rigging, and a flap change, and you're great at doing rigging, well then you say I'll do the rigging, and let uh, Corporal Bloggins here take the uh, the installation because. He's an ace at it, so know your limitations and take pick on your strongest attribute to the situation that's required. There, there are no repercu repercussions you know, if the job's done right, even if it is late. There's going to be repercussions if the job's done wrong and there's an accident. You see that happen a lot in maintenance. People who've been doing the same job. Uh, so many times they don't even check the book and the books get changed every so often too you know and torques and things they have in their little you know uh, cheat sheets in their in their coveralls so um, it's one thing you got to watch out oh yeah you got so many different types of aircrafts that unless you go get the book you're not sure whether it's you're supposed to do this on that one or you, were you supposed to do it on this model here a lot of it is education yeah, keep keep telling people, you know, you've got to check the books, you've got to use them. Photocopy the piece of the book that you need, and when you're done with it, tear it up and throw it out and do it again next time, each time you go to do the job. And as long as you do that, then you shouldn't run into problems, because you're still following the current CFTO. The distraction, that happens all the time. That, you know, we have to learn how to prevent them, yeah, or how to double check ourselves. But... I mean, the phone's constantly ringing and people getting hauled off of jobs to go and answer the phone or, you know, a new priority is set. You're halfway through 320 and now you're on to 323, you know, it's... The checks are in place, though, but sometimes they seem so redundant to us that mm -hmm. we don't do them. And if we don't do them, they don't work. Like the independent check and all that, mm -hmm. you paper whip it. If you paper whip it, it's not going to work. Right? You have to be accountable for everything you do and realize that you're responsible when you sign the work as being done, you're responsible for doing it. And if something goes wrong, it's, it's you. There's nothing stopping that. Uh... The corporal from saying to the master, well, let's go, I gotta take a phone call, and it won't take me a few minutes, why don't you go have a coffee, and you can look over the book there if you want and see what's going on, whereabouts we are, and then we'll come back and we'll go over it again. There's no reason why you had to, to rely on that job being done within a minute or two. If he's only going to be two minutes, then it's two minutes of trivial work that could be done in that time. If he you got should... back and he had to leave, he could have went and told his supervisor, you have to put somebody else on there that's qualified, I have to leave. Instead of leaving the other guy, coming back ten minutes later, signing it, and leaving to go to the hospital or whatever. Make sure the message is getting through. Talk to, talk to uh, the people around you. T tell them what you're thinking. Ask them what they're thinking. Confirm that the message is getting through. Even though you may assume that it's getting through, make sure you get them to play it back to you. If, you. if you have any doubts that the guy you're handing the job over to knows how to do it, ask him and make sure, like, confront him enough that he's going to spill the beans and say, well, no, I guess not really. Because, I mean, he may be a little embarrassed, but eventually he's going to squeal you know, and say, yeah, you're right, but I don't know. Get everybody who's involved to acknowledge the same aspect of what's required. And that's a big thing that's not done. You know, like this senior NCO comes out and tells somebody, okay, we've got to do this. He goes down and says, okay, we've got to do this. And by the time he gets down to the private, well, the private is out now looking for a, prop of, a pail of prop wash. You know, it doesn't exist. But, and all they want to do is just make sure the prop was lock wired right or something. So it's just a confirmation and on all levels, all the way up and down. Of the technicians we've heard from today would agree. Once errors start linking up, they can tear holes in the safety net of checks and procedures. But errors are a part of normal human behavior, and understanding how human factors interact in the danger zone is one way of trying to deal with them. What you have seen in this story is one example of how human factors, on the job and at home, developed into a chain of errors which led to a serious accident and injury. Of these most common factors, we had at least seven doing damage in our own small scenario. Corporal Menon David was under a growing stress as her release date approached without any solid prospects for work. 
and she wasn't getting the normal level of support from her buddy Joe. Corporal Murphy himself was certainly a classic victim of distraction and fatigue, despite being among the most experienced and careful technicians on the base. Master Corporal Brian Matt was beset by a lack of knowledge, incomplete communications, and by norms he was not comfortable with. And the entire crew was a victim of pressing to get the Herc out three days ahead of schedule. I also bear bad news, however. So one asks, who is responsible for dealing with human factors, for preventing the chain of errors? Well, like most rhetorical questions, there's no surprise. It's your supervisor, your co-workers, and you, for yourself and for each other. Our technician commentators had some good suggestions, but detailed answers to put in a manual, that's tougher. There are, however, some basic principles to keep in mind. Awareness and recognition are the most important. To be alert to the flow of work around you at all times, and to recognize the telltale signs of human factors in yourself and your co-workers. And if co-workers have a problem, don't cover it up. Help them. Don't let them hurt someone. Concealing errors just encourages their repetition. In terms of your own work, Positive thinking is probably the best therapy or antidote to things like fatigue and distraction. And try to develop your own techniques for your own job, like determining in advance of your shift that you're going to find at least one fault today and fix it. It's a bit simplistic, but rather than creating new control systems in the workplace, the main objective for people like us may simply be to monitor ourselves better and to keep the human factors out of the danger zone.